And good okay. evening. It is 6 p.m. So we are going to go ahead and get started. Um, Dr. Penlin, if you want to go ahead and begin with the welcome and introduction of our um, presenter. Sure thing. I'm Dr. Jody Penlin, Assistant Superintendent for Student Services. And I and Dr. Thomas would like to welcome you to the fourth session of our Parent Academy series. Tonight's session will focus on mental health and suicide awareness. I would now like to introduce Mr. Tom McSheehy. He is a licensed social worker in Illinois. Tom has been a social worker for 25 years and has also taught elementary school for 21 years. He has over 35 years of experience working with parents, teachers, children, families, and schools. Tom is the founder and director of Teaching Heart Institute, an organization dedicated to connecting the worlds of education and mental health and supporting teachers and parents in developing children's and teenagers' social and emotional intelligence. Along with doing presentations and workshops, Tom consults and does therapy with parents, families, teachers, and individuals. Tom is also the author of the book, In Focus, Improving Social and Emotional Intelligence, One Day at a Time. Now I'd like to turn the session over to Mr. McSheehy and thank you all for joining us tonight. Thanks, Dr. Penlin. Hi, parents. Um, I'm happy to be with you tonight and glad you took the time to show up. Um, it's a topic um, that I think it's so important to talk about. It's a bit uncomfortable, but I promise that it's gonna be a hopeful and inspiring night. Um, suicide awareness is um, something that's, you know, really critical, especially now during the pandemic of all times. And just on a personal note, um, you know, I've been touched, which I think many families have been touched by suicide. My cousin who um, was like a, another brother to me had taken his life at 39 and left behind a 10 year old daughter. And um, a, a friend, a close friend who was a, also a therapist um, and had a, two boys, 19, 20 and 18, and a husband um, took her life. So, and I've worked with, believe it or not, children who wanted to take their life. And I personally, during my life, during really dark times of dealing with depression or during really enormous bouts with physical pain that my brain definitely went to, I don't know if I can live. So I feel like I know the mind and heart of someone who thinks about taking a life. So it's something, if it's something foreign to you, I'll try to bring you into the world of that world. Um, I, and I'm going to talk about Hayden Hurst tonight, and now you'll get to know more about him. So I'm going to go to my PowerPoint and share that. So we'll have a visual to look at and share together tonight. Um, this is Hayden Hurst's family. And um, I, a school that uses my curriculum, was on a Today Show about a year ago. And for me, it was an enormous blessing and, um, to get on a Today Show, but or have my school that I was using my curriculum on a Today Show. But it allowed, it allowed the Hayden Hurst Foundation to learn about me. And I teamed up with them. And from their work, we've been helping schools in South Carolina and um, Georgia and Maryland. And now next year will be Florida too. So Aiden's journey is quite a remarkable journey. Um, I do want to just pause today because it's Earth Day. And for me, it's been very important to me. I wouldn't be talking to you if it wasn't for the environment. I got into teaching because I wanted to teach young kids about the Earth and how to protect it. Because I knew 35 years ago when I started that this was important. And today's a day to honor this day. And it's for this moment, we'll pause and just reflect that we're all sitting on this planet floating in space, which is a pretty remarkable thought. And we're it's sort of like being on a boat out in an ocean together. So um, I hope that you take time to, and the schools do to teach children about how to protect the environment. It's so important, as important as social emotional learning is. I just wanna go over what social emotional intelligence is. I start with this slide every time I present, so we're all on the same page. It's the ability to identify and manage feelings. It's the ability to control impulses or delay gratification, to persevere when things get tough, to communicate and relate effectively to others, to express empathy towards others, work cooperatively with others, 
and finally negotiate and resolve differences in a win-win manner that doesn't involve violence. You know, the pandemic has been a mental health crisis. 75% of young adults are dealing with mental health issues. That's pretty remarkable. That's high school age and beyond. That's three fourths of them. And 25% of young adults have thoughts of suicide. That's pretty common, it, even before pandemic times, it runs around 20%. So it's not uncommon and, um, and yet it needs to be talked about. It's one of those topics that is uncomfortable so people don't talk about it. And that's just my saddest feeling when I have been bout, through bouts of darkness. Um, I so want people to be willing to be with me. Often people don't know what to say to someone who's really depressed or even having thoughts of suicide. And of course, getting help is critically important, but the people around you are so important, your loved ones. And I'll talk more about that. I shared my experience earlier. Here are just some statistics about mental health and suicide. And again, there's a lot of hope about this. Suicide is the second leading cause of death among people aged 10 to 34 in the US. The overall suicide rate in the United States has increased by 35% 35 since 1999. 90% of people who die by suicide had shown symptoms of a mental health condition. And often the schools see it, but they don't know what to do. And I hope that changes soon. 75% of people who die by suicide are male. Now, females attempt it more than males, but they're not as successful. Females attempt suicide three times as often as males. 18.8% .8 of high school students have thoughts of suicide during non-pandemic non times. 8.9% of youth in grades nine to 12 have made at least one suicide attempt in the past 12 months. That's almost 10%. That to me is shocking. Female students attempted almost twice as often as male students. And that comes from just two years ago. Two and a half times as many suicides, 48,344 in the United States as there were homicides, which were 18,830. That shocks me too. That puts it sort of in perspective. Nearly half of children with depression, anxiety, ADD, and ADHD did not receive counseling or treatment from a mental health professional. I think it's higher than that to be very truthful. If you're a low income person, which at times I have been in my life, it's impossible to get quality mental health care. It just is not possible. And if you do get any care, it's usually from someone just out of college. And there's nothing against people just out of college doing mental health, but mental health, Constantly is something, the more experience, the better. Not all fields are that way, but with mental health as counselors, experience matters. 20% of youth ages 13 to 18 live with a mental health condition. So one out of five. The average delay between the onset of symptoms and intervention is eight to 10 years. That means they live or suffer really to be truthful about it. When you're dealing with the mental health condition and you can't talk about it, it's like suffering. It ten, takes 10 years to get help, if any, if you ever do. 50% of all lifetime mental health illness, illness begins by age 13 and 75% by age 24. And that's why schools and homes are so important to intervene because parents have a big role to play with mental health, but teachers in schools and classrooms even have a more powerful role sometimes because there's a container, a group of students connected together, and that can be powerful. Here's a hopeful future. Hayden Hurst was at the University of South Carolina, walked down. I don't know which year he tried to take his life. He might have been a freshman, um, and he was saved. And from that moment, he decided he was gonna start a foundation to help children and adolescents deal with mental health. And that's been his passion and his mom's passion. He plays for the Atlanta Falcons right now as their starting tight end. And last year he came out and talked about Dak Prescott who had been criticized for talking about his depression in related to his brother's suicide during the pandemic. And, and Hayden took a stand and, and made a connection with him at their game, which 
got a lot of um, uh, social media play. I want to show you this short video. It's 12 minutes long, but it speaks volumes of what I want to talk about after it tonight. And there's no better way to talk than through this video. So I'm going to stop the share and um, start the other share of a screen. And this was made by the Atlanta Falcons last year, this video, in order to publicize mental health and bring Hayden's story out to the public. I, I, um, <clears throat> I can't really explain it. It's, it's hard to unless you go through it. But depression, when you... Um, Yeah, when I was growing up, the only thing that really mattered to me were sports. Hayden never stopped moving. He was a constant motion. He was always the biggest and the fastest. And as a sibling, it was a little frustrating because he really didn't have to put too much effort into it as he was younger. He just kind of showed up and, and was great at everything. From the time that, that I can remember as a kid, just knowing in the back of my mind, it was I'm either going to be a professional baseball player or I'm gonna play in the NFL for you know X amount of years. And I asked Hayden, I said, what do you want to do? Do you want to, uh, you want to play baseball? Or you want to go to college? He goes, well, I really want to play baseball. So he went to play with the Pittsburgh Pirates down in Bradenton, Florida with their minor league camp and he did well. I remember going and watching and saying, oh my gosh, he's gonna get called up because he was just lights out throwing strikes and doing really well. He would start calling during the week and say, hey, what are you doing this weekend? I said, oh, no, nothing. Can you come down? I'm like, what's he want me to come down there for? And he would every week call me, come down, come down, come down. He wanted me around all the time. We would have phone conversations and he would tell me that he was struggling and he would tell me that he was starting to not be able to feel his hands when he would pitch or he didn't know where the ball was going. I just didn't understand that because again, my entire life of watching him play, he was just great. I kind of felt this weird feeling in my hand where you know the ball just wasn't sitting right. You know my hands were getting really sweaty and I, I felt like I didn't have control like I normally did. And then sure enough, I let like a 94 mile an hour fastball go and it hit this kid in the head and it like knocked him unconscious and they had to like come and scoop him up off the field. And for me, it was just sheer embarrassment. I feel like I finally knew that something was really dark and something was really going on when we would FaceTime him and he was in a dark room in the middle of the day by himself. And I mean, I, as far as this camera is away from me, I, I mean, I couldn't even play catch with a kid. Yeah, you know, and I'm supposed to be a professional baseball player. And it was just, it was horrible. Um, it really affected me on the field, obviously. And then off the field, it just created a downward spiral in my life. He would get to the point with drinking that he would black out because he just didn't want to have those feelings anymore. And, um, and it was very tough on us because he didn't come to us. He actually went to a pitching coach and just said, you know, I'm not enjoying this anymore. And he said, look, he said, I've never seen a kid try to fix something so hard in my life. He says, and I've been doing this all my life. He says, we've done everything and he wants to move on. And the pitching coach said, well, what do you miss? And he just said, I miss the football part. So he said, well, go play football. And so I always told Hayden, it's gonna, it's gonna work out, it's gonna be okay. And I remember him telling me, mom, it's not working out, I'm done. I'm gonna go play football. And I told him I thought he was crazy. To sit there and walk into another sport that he had played one season of in high school, I, I mean, I thought he was insane really that moment where I decided to hang it up and leave baseball behind me was huge for me. I felt like a weight was lifted off my shoulder because I got to just leave that crap behind me. Jerry, how are you doing? Steve Spurrier Jr. calling you about 1.30. Hayden has been officially admitted to the University of South Carolina. 
I honestly thought that I was going to leave everything behind me. I get to South Carolina, you know, and I'm still drinking, I'm still turning to drugs, trying just to numb that pain, I guess, of having my childhood dream ripped away from me. What I went through for those three years was horrible. Um, and he was drinking like he was at a bar. Like he was heavily drinking in a family setting just on a Saturday night with the rest of us to the point where he was getting like really intoxicated and really blacking out and kind of mean. And he's never been like that. Uh, I, um, <clears throat> I can't really explain it. It's, it's hard to unless you go through it. But depression, when you... Um, You feel, you feel like nobody's there. Uh, despite my family being so close, and they're, they're, willing, they're willing to do whatever, but when you're in that headspace and you're in that dark spot, you do, you feel alone. You feel like nobody's there, nobody cares. So I guess for me in those years, um, that's why I turned to drinking and, and pills and cocaine, like anything that I could get my hands on to numb that feeling of embarrassment where I wouldn't have to explain myself to my family as to why my life was like unraveling. Um, and one night it just caught up to me. 911, what is your I'll never forget my husband and I were at our lake house. I remember him coming in to the bedroom and saying, we have to go to Columbia. And I'm like, why are we driving to Columbia? And he goes, Hayden tried to take his life. Kylie, this is mom. When you get this message, it's pretty important. Please call me as soon as you can. Um, please call. At that point, I wanted out. I, I just, I'd fought for, for so long and I just, I wanted it to be over. And um, for, uh, for some reason, I, I got a second chance at this thing. He was embarrassed, humiliated. He was in, in this room and the room was like almost like a jail cell. We had five minutes that we were given to speak to him. And he held his head down and he wouldn't talk to us. And I said, Hayden, we have five minutes with you. You have to share with us what happened. It was the best and the worst thing that's ever happened in my life because when I made that decision, when I was sitting in that hospital room, kind of reflecting on everything that I had done, I, I made a promise to myself, it's like, we're, I'm not gonna do this again. You know, I, for, for whatever reason, God looked down on me and gave me a second shot at this thing. And uh, I made a promise, like, I'm, I'm gonna make the most of this opportunity. Coach Muschamp, he tried to call the hospital every single day, even though they told him every single day, he was like, hey, you, you can't talk to him, and he demanded. He's like, I need to talk to him, and for four days called and just got rejected. Just having that support system in, in moments like that is just is crucial. You don't know which way is up. You know, you're, you're looking for help any way you can get it. And um, for those people to be there for me really helped save my life. And he started just on his own, just cleaning up. He hasn't had a drink since that night. And I dove straight into football. And I was working out two, three times a day. You know, guys on the team were like, man, this guy's, he's a kiss ass and he's trying to show the coaches. But I didn't care. I blocked everything out and I dove in 100%. And I just became a freak. Anything that I could do football-wise, I was doing it because I was gonna make it work. Select Hayden Hurst. 
And all of a sudden, boom, my phone rings and Ozzie Newsom's on the other line. It's like, man, this is really happening. Once they showed it on the television and Hayden, Hayden called the four of us together and we had a wonderful embrace because we were thrilled for him. Because a, a lot of the emotion and anxiety and hard work that he put in came through in all that, that wonderful call. Shortly after the draft, he said, um, Mom and Dad, I, I want you guys to retire. And I, so I said, no, not hardly. He goes, no, no, no. He says, I want to have a foundation for suicide prevention, and I want you guys to run it for me. He goes, Mom, I want to start a foundation, and I want to focus on young people because I want young people to learn the tools and the foundation for handling anxiety and, and learning from it. Hey, I got a lot of respect for what you Appreciate did. Came you. out and talked about it. me and my mom have a foundation about suicide prevention. Yeah, respect the hell out of you Appreciate for talking you, about it, man. Collab one day. Absolutely. When you are the quarterback for the Dallas Cowboys and you're scrutinized so much already, and you come out and you talk about, hey, I was feeling this way with depression. You know, I, I suffered loss in my family with suicide. Um, what a brave thing to come out and talk about. And then for the kind of the backlash that he got, I thought was just completely outrageous. When Hayden has his cleats for a cause at December 6th game, he's not only representing his foundation, he's representing Dak Prescott and Solomon Thomas, because that's what it's all about, is getting the message out and letting people feel comfortable talking about their feelings. I think my message would be don't make permanent decisions on temporary feelings. That there are resources out there to help you. You are loved, you are wanted, you are appreciated. You were put on this earth for a reason. We can do something to help you out. Don't hide it. You gotta be strong, come forward with it. Let us know what's going on. Don't, don't think that you are the only one out there having these feelings or thoughts and go to someone. Keep fighting, keep going, because as bad as, it, as dark as it gets, I promise you there is someone out there who cares and loves you and wants to see you succeed at whatever you do. It doesn't have to be professional sports. You know, I promise you there is somebody out there in your life that loves you and that will support you and will help you get out of that situation. Well, that's, uh, you get a glimpse, that's Hayden Hurst and his story. I want to just um, share with you, Kathy Hurst, Dr. Thomas had wanted Kathy Hurst to join me tonight and talk, and she couldn't do it again, she said. That evening, we did one for Rock Hill in early February, and it, it really was hard for her to speak. She wanted to, and she did. Um, but emotionally, it's still tough for her to deal with. And so, but I do want to play what she told Rock Hill parents because it's, it's too powerful not to share. So I'm going to pull up the recording um, and share just that glimpse of what she shared. Let's see how we can do that. Uh, there it is right here. Okay. And the slide you're looking at now is that that video that you just watched, the Falcons saw that over 9 million people actually viewed that video. And that's not even saying that if I shared it with you and then you shared it with 20 of your friends, we don't even know how far a reach it actually had. But at least 9 million people viewed it. And I can't even begin to tell you the number of people 
that reached out to either our foundation through emails or social media, people direct messaging Hayden and not only thanking him, but I think it's because we were so open and vulnerable sharing our story that these people were like, I have to tell you what we've experienced, what we've gone through. And it's been so amazing for us because you just, you realize, as I said earlier, when you think of that mental health issues, it's such a range and each family has some story to tell or some experience that a loved one has had. Tom, you're muted. Let's fast forward here. Just to bear with me, there we go. So mining the gold out of a painful experience and Kathy's gonna share her wisdom with you right now. So if there's any words of wisdom, I would tell you as, as you heard Hayden say in the video, he went to his pitching coach. He did not come directly to my husband or I or, or his sister. And I think it was because of that embarrassment and he didn't want to disappoint us because he felt like he was going to be the answer for our family, that he was going to play in the major leagues and make all this money and, and keep us happy the rest of our lives. And the, and the thing was that my husband and I did fine on our own. We had no expectations asking that of Hayden. And for him to feel that pressure was just incredible. But I'm glad he went and spoke to somebody. So watch for signs with your kids and have conversations with them. And if I could share this with you, if I could go back and redo my kids' younger years, I wish I had been more vulnerable, if you will, or open with them. Um, as I said, my career was in sales. And of course, I traveled a lot. I was a national account manager for a company. And so I would have to prepare presentations and, and mentally prepare for it. And so I'm sure I was anxious. And if they came to me with something, my kids, I probably was short with them and, and reacted to them. And instead of me being open, instead of just trying to be that strong mom figure, I didn't share with them to say, you know what, guys, I want to let you know, I have a huge presentation tomorrow and I'm very anxious. So if I snap at you or I'm short with you, just know I'm not perfect and I have problems too. And so I want you to know it's okay not to be that perfect person. So maybe if I had had that conversation with the younger Hayden, maybe he would have made other decisions. So don't be afraid because no one gave us a parenting 101 manual and said, hey, this is how to be a perfect parent. We learned from our experience with our parents and our situations. So it's okay not to be okay. Even for a parent, we don't have to be perfect. So I just want you to understand that and just you know, be aware and, and really look for those signs with your kids, especially today in this pandemic world where they're not in school every day. They're not doing all their sports or after school activities choir, ballet, whatever it may be that they have their outlet. Because I know like for Hayden, he's already started his workout for the season. It's what, February? But that is his way to channel that anxiety. He gets it out and lifting heavy weights. And I know for me, a 61 year old mom, is I love my little 30 minute exercise too. I get on an exercise bike or I do my kettlebell, but it's a way to get those endorphins going and get those thoughts out of your brain. So just like we think, oh, our kids can't be feeling that way. We do, so wh why can't they have those sensations and those feelings? Oh, we'll go back, so, we'll go back to the screen share here. Thank you, Kathy. Let's see, so, let me stop that one. Um, okay, very good. So I'm gonna go back to my screen share now of my PowerPoint and my keynote. That was a few words from Kathy and we'll get a few more at the end, but um, 
One thing I wanted to share is just, I'm so glad to see mental health after 35 years. And Hayden Hurst won the Allen Page Community Award last year for his work with schools and mental health. And he actually won the, the final award at the end of the year, which was a real honor for his, his own colleagues in the NFL to vote mental health as a cause that they thought was worthy of winning makes me feel hopeful about the future. There is so much hope related to suicide and mental health with education, awareness, and prevention. The pandemic has had silver linings for mental health and social emotional learning. I wanna talk about depression, anxiety, suicide, and the brain really quickly. If you've been on other um, presentations I did, you'll know a little bit, but stress, which a pandemic will cause, being low income will cause, a lot of things cause stress, can cause depression because it affects the brain. The lower parts of the brain, the limbic system or the brainstem, or where the limbic system is where the brainstem is. You know, this area, the emotional center is what is affected by, by stress. And if it can cause depression and that's the source of it right there. I want you to know there's a place in the brain and that's what antidepressants try to work on is the serotonin or chemicals there. Um, I want to jump forward just to honor, but I wanted, this is the, the emotional part of the brain. So I want you, you to see that all human beings, regardless of race or culture, look the same emotionally on the inside. And, um, and that part that right behind your eyes, that's called the frontal cortex. That's so important related to depression and suicide. That's where we, we reflect on our emotions and make good decisions. And that's when you work with your child and make a connection with him or her, you're working on that front part of the brain. I do wanna say something about the, the gut and the brain because it's so big and not talked about, but there's a relationship. Your gut or your intestines is called your second brain. And for good reason, you won't believe this, but 70% of your immune systems in your gut 90% of your serotonin is produced there. That's the feel-good chemical that makes you feel optimistic about life. That's what antidepressants work on. And 50% of the dopamine. And if you were on the last presentation last week, we talked about cell phones and video games and dopamine makes it's re the reward chemical in your brain that makes it kind of brings pleasure on. Well, your gut produces all those two chemicals and boosts your immune system. So what that says is it's so important to do your best to eat well, you know, vegetables, a lot of vegetables and, and good balanced diet of fruits and vegetables and, um, and trying to avoid things like sugar, which is hard in life. And then of course, exercise, which reduces stress is going to make a big, they, the research says that exercise is as effective as antidepressants in terms of depression. And so much of suicide, I can speak from experience of suicidal thoughts is when I'm in a very dark place. And it's not all to do with attitude. It has to do with brain chemistry, which has to do with my gut, eating well and moving. It, they're very much tied together. Low levels of serotonin have been linked to a higher risk of suicide. That I know for sure. The risk factors for suicide, these are some. Hey, Hayden. Uh -huh. I know you don't know me. Currently, um, I'm with the military. I'm in the United States Army right now, Fort Campbell. Um, I know exactly how it feels, um, the, the darkness, the abyss, the, uh, the loneliness that you feel and when you think that's the only answer you have left. And um, I just want to say thank you. Thank you so much for all you're doing for fighting mental health, that, that stigma against it and talking about it. You know, so much this has to do with darkness and being alone and shame and stigmas. And when you reach out, that connection is part of the healing and helping mental health. The most common causes of depression, up and upper left brain chemistry imbalance, no doubt about it, stress, genetics and biology. But that doesn't, just because you have a predisposition towards a depression doesn't mean it's going to happen. There's got to be a stressor that causes it. Drugs, obviously, they show coffee, which I don't know if I'd put into the realm of drugs, but uh, more things like cocaine and other things. Um, down at the bottom, traumatic events, 
speaking from experience and having been through trauma, big factor related to suicide. Large number of veterans coming back from the war take their lives because of PTSD. Um, female sex hormones, poor nutrition there, and physical health problems. The risk factors for suicide are a history of trauma or abuse, and I'm happy that I'll be talking about trauma in May with you during Mental Health Month. PTSD, which is post-traumatic stress syndrome, intense, consistent stress without support. That's the important thing, without support, because stress and trauma and stress and traumatic events don't necessarily turn into PTSD. If you have support, it doesn't. Depression and chronic anxiety alcohol and other substance use disorders. A lot of time my brother self-medicated with alcohol. That's how he dealt with his sadness. Lack of social support and sense of isolation. That's a tough one because there's so many stigmas out there that we isolate when we're feeling down. I do wanna go back, whoops, sorry, to this one because my family, the lack of social support, often when I'm sad, they want me to think positive. And often what I crave in a world of darkness or sadness when I go through bouts are just people who want to connect with me and tell me they love me, not trying to fix me or get me out of it, because you can't snap your fingers and just think positive thoughts and get out of depression. If it was that easy, depression wouldn't exist. Stigma associated with asking for help. That's huge. Most men and boys don't want to ask for help, which is very sad. A lack of health care especially mental health and substance abuse treatment. If you're a low income person or even middle income, it's tough to afford mental health. Hopefully our country will see how much it helps and saves money to help people this way. Family history of suicide, recent job or financial loss or loss of relationship. That's what happened to my cousin who took his life. Chronic emotional or physical pain, that, when I've been in bouts of deep pain for years, that has cost my brain. Easy access to lethal means. It's very important. One of the arguments about guns in homes that are they're accessible. Being bullied. Most shooters of, at schools are male, white male, for whatever reason. Um, they've been bullied all their life and they have trauma. Those are the characteristics often and they're isolated and angry. A previous suicide attempt, dropping out of school, huge factor. Sexual assault and a shame that comes with it and a history of self-harm. And I'll be talking about high sensitivity in May, about highly sensitive kids and adolescents, which they have a propensity or a tendency towards suicide. And I'll explain why at that time. What are the signs to look for in your kids? wanting to die. I mean, that's just, you don't want to die. That's the wrong way to say it. You don't know, you don't know how to get out of the pain and the darkness. No one wants to die. Great amount of shame and guilt. That I know personally, again, is true. And the paradox is you feel shame about being depressed and having suicidal thoughts. And when you call someone, it's hard to talk about suicide, especially you know, because there's such a stigma about it. Feeling like a burden to others, you often feel like a burden. I, when I would go through dark patches, when I was going through all the pain and I reach out to people and my story would be the same week after week, I felt like a burden to people. And all I was craving when I called them was human contact and to know that they loved me. They, I didn't expect them to have any fixes, but I just wanted human contact and know I still was loved. And so if you're wondering what to say, that's mostly what you need to say, because sometimes it's, it's, you can get help, you can get on medication, you can do the right things and it still takes time. And you just need people who hang in there with you. You're extremely, by the way, sorry, you, the one above it, number four, extreme, empty, hopeless, trapped, and no reason to live. I, and that's an important part. You know, during my bout with pain, I was going through intense pain for three and a half years. I had my, this work that kept me going because it, it is my reason I'm on this planet. And so that kept me going. And everyone has a reason they're on the planet. You just have to find what that is. Extremely sad, more anxious, and full of rage when you're, when you're suicidal. Unbearable emotional or physical pain. Withdrawing from friends and isolating. Giving away important items. 
using alcohol and drugs more often, eating or sleeping more or less often, displaying extreme mood swings, taking extreme risks like driving very fast. If you see any of those signs, please talk to your child and not with an accusatory or tough edge, but a wanting to help and be there for them. Last week, I showed you this window of tolerance that we, when we teach children at a young age how to feel their emotions and calm themselves, that they can stay in the window of tolerance where they can feel emotions and stay in relationship with people without going extremely hyper or hypo. But if you look down at the hypo at the bottom, that tends towards depression. Is you're shut down, you're numb, depression, you're passive, withdrawn, you freeze and you're in shame. That's when you're, you're just overwhelmed and you don't know what to do. By the way, when I was in therapy and I started at 32, I often found when I was deeply sad or deeply angry and I could release that in a safe environment and be heard by a therapist and really seen that often my depression lifted. Often when we're pushing down emotions, it makes us depressed. Not always, but often. How can you prevent suicide? Number one, is quality connection with parents, teachers, coaches, and peers. All you need is one person who deeply loves you and hangs in there with you. That is critical. I can't, and, and you know, teams and classrooms where you feel like you're connected and you can share and talk because if other kids hear about that they're sad and depressed, you feel less alone and like something's wrong with you. And that's the moment of healing. Often the moments that, that I feel relief from, from sadness or anxiety or darkness is when another human being shares their vulnerability. And I feel like I'm not alone. And when you're in a classroom and kids are sharing their vulnerabilities, that is often the, the solution. It doesn't take away whatever's going on, but they feel less alone and connected human beings and they're willing to persevere. And then things do get better, like for Hayden Hurst. And they do for me and have. The other thing is belonging. We all want to belong, whether it's to a family or a classroom or a school or a team or a church or whatever, and feel accepted for who we are, where we are at that time. Unfortunately, more and more kids are looking for their connection here. They don't know how to feel. They don't know how to connect with each other. And these are easy, like, like I showed last week, like cupcakes for eating. They're just so easy. And they give them dopamine but they don't fill them up in a nutritious, healthy way or their brains. And it can tend towards depression. And this is what happens. And this is where we get worried. I've been here and you know, it's a tough place to be. What's tougher is to find people who hang in there with you and tougher to find good mental health people who will support you and being able to afford it. Because when you get here, you need connection, number one. And parents, you know, again, what you don't come with a manual and you don't, uh, we weren't raised with the brain science we know now and the knowledge we know now. And parents are trying to learn skills they weren't taught as children. And so support's critical for you. And that's why I'm glad you're listening tonight. Because ultimately it is just about being, you know, the connection part. And this is, I've showed you each time I've talked to you, this type of connection where you're just listening to the feelings without trying to fix or take away the feeling and just trying to feel the feeling yourself and be present. Because when people have tried just to understand me and where I'm at, that is often all I need, you know? And there's a sense of relief inside my body and there's a resiliency that comes forth by people just being there and seeing me for who I am. And I've shared this, you know, when you're trying to remember this FCD is just to try to feel the sensations and emotions with your child and identify them and, and empathize and then maybe search out comforting, whether it's a hug or a deep breathing or a walk around the block. And then maybe there's something to do, you know, maybe it's your child's being bullied, but don't, don't go to doing before feeling because you want them to learn how to feel. And because, and you want them to learn how to comfort themselves through being comforted. And this is Hayden with a group of teenagers, you know, this source of connection, this is what we crave as human beings, that we're not alone. And there's not something wrong with us just because we're anxious or sad. You know, I use this graphic and it speaks about connection. 
you know, it's so easy to go after sugar. That's how I self-soothed as a little boy and as a teenager. And it really was an addiction. And so much of what I craved was more nutritious contact. You know, that was like an apple, physical contact with people see me, but it wasn't available. You know, and this is what kind of the form of connection, you know, we can easily turn to TV, which we all do sometimes to tune out or, or video games, but ultimately down deep, we crave connection with people who don't have an agenda for us. You know, Kathy's reflection, and I don't know if I will be able to share it. Let's see about, um, let's just see. I think I do have time. Um, I just want to go back to that thing because it's, again, too powerful not. I actually might share the prevention of suicide first because I want to be sure to get to this piece. Um, so let me go back to sharing my screen again because I think, nope, I'm still sharing it, I think. Um, just want to play this slide because this is important. First of all, as I said, you know, connection to parents, teachers, peers, and coaches. And, you know, if you, if it's uncomfortable to connect, what I find is just being real with kids and teenagers and saying, hey, I want to connect and I don't know how, or I'm not good at feeling feelings, but I want to be there more for you and listen better. And I'll try, even if it's uncomfortable. You know, safety and the ability to be vulnerable and share openly. I know vulnerability seems like a weakness, but we're finding it's a strength. And what you saw in Hayden Hurst, the reason he had 9 million views for that video because he was, he's a 6'5", 250 pound tight end who was crying. And people were touched by that. And there's tons and tons of people who are lonely in this world and isolated and craving to talk about what's going on inside them. And I think Hayden touched the bone and Kathy's sadness. People resonate with vulnerability and research shows it's a strength and not a weakness. That's what we were taught. You know, SEL, which stands for social emotional learning in homes and schools and sports and churches and all organizations. And that's why it's so critical to get it in schools and homes. Support for parents and caregivers from conception to three years old. In May, I'll be talking about those first three years again. And if they were tough years for you or your child, how to repair them, because that's so important to mental health is the first three years of life. And parents don't get so, very much support in, our, in the United States, to be truthful. It's the best economic. If we had to do one thing today besides, well, there's many things, but this would be the most powerful thing we could do is support parents from birth to three. Classrooms in which students feel a deep sense of belonging and that they are valued and matter. And that's what SEL does. Access to quality health care and mental health services, including therapy and medication, Boy, I hope I live long enough to see our government give quality support to everyone on this planet because I've been blessed to go to therapy at the age of 32 and be able to afford it out of my teacher pay. And the, the, the therapists and how much it meant to my life, you know, in some ways they saved my life. Um, so everyone deserves that, that sense of coaching. It's not even like something's wrong with you. It's just basic coaching on how your brain works and how to deal with the world access to experienced and talented trauma therapists. You know, it's taken me a long time to be a trauma therapist and I was gifted enough to be around talented trauma therapists. And every kid, especially low-income kids deserve trauma therapists, you know, they just do. Access to quality food and exercise. Again, that should be a given in this planet. Economic support, job training, jobs, economic assistance, daycare, to reduce stress. I know that seems like a pie dream. It isn't. And it's critical for mental health. And everyone deserves this. You know, the times I was low income, I could watch my brain and how it was affected. And it's had an enormous effect on my brain and my mental health. And I'm a talented person, just like every other human being on this planet. And all we need is the right conditions to thrive. That's it. There are no smarter or better human beings on this planet. Everyone has a gift, not in the same area, but in some area. Helping teenagers explore their strengths and their purpose on this planet. Rarely do, rarely we do, talk to, rarely do we talk to teenagers about why they're on this earth and what their strengths are and talents are. We talk to teachers and tell them about their challenges, you know, that kids can talk to their teachers and share challenges in a classroom. We need an expanded education of public, of the public about mental health and stigmas because the stigmas are killing us. 
the feeling of being okay, not being okay. You know, just because I'm sad or depressed doesn't mean I'm not okay. I am. We are all human and we're connected and not alone. I'm thankful that in May I'll be able to talk about these two topics that don't get talked about, trauma and highly sensitive youth. They contribute a big, enormous factors in suicide, enormous. And, you know, I just want to share this, the power of showing your vulnerability. To me, I'm most honored when people are willing to share something going on inside them. I'm touched by it and not as a therapist, as a human being. And people, this is what Hayden, he got tons of people reaching out saying, thank you. Thank you for opening up the door to mental health and stigma. I've been suffering alone. How does a mother thank their son for helping share his story and saving so many other people's lives? Hey Hayden, how's it going? I just wanted to take a moment and thank you for sharing your story with the world. Your story was raw, unfiltered, and resonated with so many. I shared your story with members of the police department that I work at, and the response was very positive. Sharing your story, sharing my story, has allowed others to open the door, which has been barricaded by stress, anxiety, worries, fears, and depression. Hi Hayden, my name is Gabby. You moved me to tears because I know that it's so difficult to speak about something that you struggled with because it brings back all of those memories. Just sharing your story, you've impacted so many people, millions of people, and you've impacted me and you've inspired me to continue to speak about mental health because it's something that I have struggled with. On December 16th, I came across your video, Breaking the Stigma. I immediately sent that to my family in a group chat. And as a family, we cried together. You see, my son Brady, more than four years ago, attempted suicide as well. Not only was uh, the road after suicide tough, it took, us, it took us for a ride I was not prepared for as a father. You guys allowed us to have a look into your life and what you were going through, and it helped us. As you said in your video, it's developing the tools and dealing with depression that will help us get through each day. You're helping people. And long after your days are over on the gridiron, you'll continue to help. The world's a better place with Hayden Hurst and Brady Walkenbach in it. The video you posted, you allowed yourself to be vulnerable. Vulnerability gives power to the hopeless. And you gave power to a lot of people by showing your story, allowing us to be open with our stories. It means a lot to know that someone knows what you're going through all the time and that someone's making a change to continuously impact the world. I just wanna say thank you, Aiden, so much. You inspire me. People like you speaking up is what we need and it gives people like me the strength. Thank you, thank you from the bottom of my heart. Thank you for being a special part of the change, the way people see and talk about their mental health. I'm so very proud of you, Hayden. Keep up the great work. I love you, Mom. You know, um... I just want to share some mental health resources here. First of all, the National Suicide Hotline, 1-800-273-TALK. And please, you know, again, this is a conversation to have with your, with your um, teenagers for sure. And um, if you see signs in younger children, then, then speak up about it. There's a suicide prevention hotline. There's the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention. These are all online. The National Alliance of Mental Health, NAMI, which is a wonderful organization. And, and hashtag Sam here, this, the same, or the same here, same here movement. These are all good, or not good, great resources. I wanna go over the parent SEL resources. Uh, Dr. Thomas is gonna put in the chat line four things. Three of them are from last week, things that you can work on at home. 
identifying the six emotions, the six calming strategies, um, the resources I'm about to show you, and then Hayden's video. If you want to share it with other people or watch it again to be uplifted, please do and please share it with people. Because again, when people share it, one of the women, the woman that you saw say thank you to Hayden plays for the Houston Rush. She's a professional soccer player. She's now started opening up in the te Texas area about her anxiety. Everyone saw her as happy-go-lucky and didn't know she was so anxious. And now because of Hayden, she's talking. So the more we do this, the more we're gonna help um, break down the stigma. My in focus SEL curriculum is for home and school. It's not just for parents, but it's in combination to be used together. So that's a resource. The whole brain child, brainstorm, and parenting from inside out by Daniel Siegel. These are all on the, the thing that Dr. Thomas is sharing the document with you. Trauma proofing your kids. I'll be talking about trauma in May by Dr. Peter Levine. These are gifted people. The highly sensitive child by Elaine Iran and the connected child, which talks about foster care and adopted children. These are what these books look like. Daniel Siegel's, The Whole Brain Child. Daniel Siegel, No Drama Discipline. Daniel Siegel brainstorm for teenagers. Daniel Siegel is gifted in attachment and the brain. And if you wanna learn about what goes on inside you and the power it has on children, parenting from inside out. Peter Levine, trauma proofing your kids, the highly sensitive child and the connected child. And one that I, that's on the list too is Heather Ford's. If you have a child who's acting out and often getting, you know, having issues with behavior at school, it's probably connected to trauma. And her book is so wonderful because it talks about the brain and talks about easy ways to support your child at home with trauma. And then these are my books. I just wanna encourage you in the last few minutes, whatever pain you're going through, to try to look to take it and turn it into a gift for you and other people in your life. There's no doubt that's my story and it's the story of many other people, including you name it from um, uh, Martin Luther King, you, you know, um, and so many people, my brain's blanking right now because of anxiety and time. If you're interested in Hayden Hurst Family Foundation and more about Hayden, you can go to the Hayden Hurst Foundation. Or if you feel moved to make a donation, the money is going to go in to fund programs in schools, most of it, and mental health clinics. And finally, if you want to know more about me, my website is just bare bones, and I'm having a brand new one developed right now, which will have online courses for parents. And I'm so excited by that to be able to support parents and teachers via online but it's teachingheartinstitute.com. Or if you want to email me and ask me a question, Tom at teachingheartinstitute.com. And I will be back in May. And I just want to say thank you to Dr. Thomas and to Lawrence County School District because she is val you know, I know how much she's valued mental health. And it means so much to see a school system support parents at home with mental health. And I'm so happy to be able to talk to you. So I hope this helped in some way. Hope it's given you some hope tonight. And um, you know, I, I look forward to seeing you in May, I guess, and have a good evening. Take care. Mr. McSheehy, thank you so much again for having another great session with sharing very relevant and meaningful information. So I definitely hope that this is something that parents are able to take back and use with their children, as well as educators, as we continue to work to support students that we are also have a lot of great takeaways that we can use as well as we continue to support students as well. So thank you so much. I really appreciate, um, you did an awesome job. I was um, privileged enough to attend um, a session with Rock Hill School District as Mr. McSheehy um, stated. And so I told him, I said, oh, we have to bring that message to Lawrence County School District 55. And so he talked to Kathy and then he came back and said that she said it was just too emotional. She couldn't do it again, but he said he would try his best to convey the same message and you did an outstanding job. So thank you so much. And we really appreciate your partnership with us as we continue to focus on um, mental health and social emotional learning. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Dr. Thomas. Thank you. Thank you, parents. And I did, I did post the information and resources in the chat, 
We will also send those out to you all as well through your email, but they are in the chat if you want to copy and paste that so that you can have those available. Um, and if you have any questions, you can put those in the chat or come off mute. Yeah, I'd be happy to stay out a few minutes and answer any questions. Um, so don't, don't hesitate or be shy, please. Feel free to ask a question. I'd, I'd love to connect. I am not seeing any questions. So they have your contact information and we'll have the resources provided as well. So again, thank you, Mr. McSheehy. Thank you to all the parents and educators who joined us this evening. And um, we look forward to some upcoming sessions in May. Thank you.